And thank you again for being here. And I'm gonna give it over to the authors now. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Melissa Tamani. I am one of the researchers uh, who made this report. I also want to thank you for being here today uh, and I want to present the project team. Um, well, first it's Amber. Amber, would you like to say hi? <laughs> hi. Uh, uh, Amber uh, is based on Canada and she's part of the R Plus Feminism Collective. Uh, Monica. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, she's a, uh, she has a PhD and it's, it's a freelance writer and researcher. She's based in Seattle. And myself, well, I, am, I have the honor to be part of the R Plus Feminism Collective since 2015. And I am based in Lima, Peru. I also want to thank uh, our advisory board. Uh, some of them are present in this call. Uh, they are Susan Barnum, um, she's a librarian and an admin in English Wikipedia. Um, also Mariana Fossati, uh, who is in, in this call. Uh, she's from Uruguay and she's a member of the project Who's Knowledge. Uh, which you probably know, uh, Camille Larive. Ella is. Uh, I'm sorry. I just. <laughs> I'm, I'm fluent in Spanish, of course, <laughs> and, and I just. Um, I just mixed <laughs> languages. Uh, Camille Larive. She's an artist and a community in residence. She's based in Montreal, Canada. Walla Abdel Manayem, she's an educator and an admin in, an, in Arabic Wikipedia. She's based in Cairo, in Egypt. Walla is also present with us today. And Hello, I'm Fan, she's an academic and she is a member of Wikimedia Canada. She's based in Montreal. So having said that, I think we can go to the next slide. And the first things we want to do is to let you know that we are really happy to have been able to present this report. And the idea of this session is really to uh, celebrate this work we've done as a collective with you. So it's, the idea is, is not really to have a workshop or, or a training, it's just to be able to share the process uh, of making this work uh, with you and also to hear your questions and to probably, uh, if, if we if if we're lucky to to continue imagining and and identifying ways to make some positive changes in, in Wikipedia and in Wikimedia in general. Uh, so thank you for being here. I think we can go to the next slide. Same slide, but um, we also want to thank Wikicred directly. Um, they funded a lot of this research. Um, our goal with the project was to provide insight on how some of the definitions and interpretations of the concept of reliable source impact coverage of marginalized communities on Wikipedia. And this categorization includes, but isn't limited to uh, cis and transgender women, non-binary people, non-Western communities, LGBTQ plus communities, BIPOC communities. So we wanted to address some of Wikipedia's information gaps and we wanted to do so in English, French, and Spanish. Those are the languages that we speak. Um, we wanted to also understand how source authority is negotiated among editors involved in these communities. Monica, I'm passing it to you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, so the goal behind the effort was to understand the effects of the current set of reliable source guidelines as they're played out in these three languages um, and the ways in which they work as kind of rules, knowing that rules can be changed on Wikipedia, but keeping in mind how processes happen um, and affecting the participation of and content about marginalized communities. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the methodology that guided our work. Um, we accomplished this report by using an intersectional feminist method methodology. And I'll just say a little bit about what that means. Um, intersectional feminist research is committed to questions of power 
including how differences are created and reproduced. While united in struggle, scholars and activists before us have taken diverging analytical lenses to understand and remedy oppressive structures of power. And so we're building on those efforts by acknowledging that knowledge is situated and knowers have partial perspectives. In other words, there's no such thing as purely objective knowledge. There's not purely objective knowers. So we came into this going, there's ways in which people are knowing and understanding reliable source guidelines that may or may not be on the pages themselves. There are practices of knowing. And so we had three parts to our project, qualitative research of the guidelines, and then community conversations uh, focused on each of the three languages um, where we listened to how people were understanding their own experiences, guiding new editors to participate. Um, and we reclaimed these off wiki processes and conversational spaces as legitimate spaces to know um, how, what reliability and reliable sources on Wikipedia mean. Um, and they kind of guided the, the analysis that we did of the guidelines. And this slide here that you're looking at is drawn from our report um, that kind of lays out what, what we did um, and how it went. So I think we can move on and now describe to you uh, our findings, some of our findings. So we laid out which what the reliable source guidelines are um, in each language. So I'll talk a little bit about English. This chart here provides a quick summary. In English, uh, the Reliable Source Guideline was created in 2005. Um, there's a large number of edits that take place early on in the project. Um, and then there's a great number of editorial changes that happen later on in the project. It's a content guideline. It's not one of the three core content policies, but it really informs uh, the guidelines as well as other guidelines around um, uh, the creation of articles such as the general notability guideline, the reliable source guideline is it kind of adjacent to that. Um, one of the things that we noticed in the guideline is that there's no clear definition of reliable within it. And we also noticed that, um, which we can talk a little bit more about, there is a general kind of ambiguity around how source authority is determined. And sometimes this takes place in complementary spaces such as the reliable source notice board, uh, the talk page of the, the content guideline itself, and then in the list of perennial sources. Now I will pass to, uh... to me, to me to talk about French. And so I want to say that in French, there's a lot of places where you can go and access information on what is a reliable source. You can go to Cité Source, you can go to um, um, source fiable, which is a direct translation of reliable sources and probably the most invested page. Um, and these again, these are recommendations. They're not, um, they're not authoritative, but um, they're also contradictory. So there's no definition of reliability on any of them. Some of them include certain types of sources as viable and uh, other spaces. So for example, Observatoire des Sources is a, is a compilation of sources doesn't it won't include certain types of sources on it so looking through this it felt um, both contradictory and overwhelming to understand what could be construed as a reliable source and of course the translation of the guideline from english um, prioritizes a knowledge formation that might not be familiar or beneficial to francophone communities now i'll pass it on to you Thank you, Amber. Um, so it was very interesting to be able to compare these three languages. And in the case of Spanish Wikipedia, it's it's the opposite of uh, French and English Wikipedia in many ways. Um, first of all, the page, as, as many policies in Spanish Wikipedia, uh, were started as translations from English. And this was also the case of this page in 2008. And it took a year for it to be uh, finalized and approved by, by the community. 
Uh, so another thing that is different is that um, the reliable sources uh, guideline is a policy on Spanish Wikipedia that's the, um, the it has that it's the um, it's higher than uh, a guideline but it's the case of English Wikipedia and definitely higher than the essay that there is in French Wikipedia so uh, really this is the, the main and almost the only uh, place to uh, to search for guidance about reliable sources on this language. Um, as my colleagues have mentioned, that there isn't really a definition of reliability. What I found were um, some sort of recommendations about how to interpret sources, um, and there are no complementary pages. So uh, what we did was to uh, take a, a close look to the to the policies, to the view history tab. Uh, to all the information we, we could find about them, and then we contrast that with uh, people who are editing in this language. Uh, so it was very interesting to see um, what the policy says and how it's interpreted and how uh, it's um, in many times used uh, in, a, in a way that it uh, makes harder for marginalized communities to, to be included on Wikipedia. So you can find all the details and the information in, in the report. And I think I'll also mention this. Um, um, and one of the conclusions we have uh, is that um, the authority of a source uh, is facilitated by uh, social, social and technical processes that elevate decisions made by a small number of self-selected editors. Um, and we're going to talk about, about that more in detail in, in, in the next slides. Uh, and we definitely think this is a problem uh, in, in all these three Wikipedias. Uh, because uh, it's like the infrastructure of Wikipedia. It's, it's the challenge right now to include this kind of uh, uh, information. Would you like to go to the next slide, Amber? Sure. So uh, we... Um, we organized a report uh, with a section about finding, and we found three of them. Uh, the first one is the lack of rigor, and that means that um, there are uh, when the policies were built, uh, there weren't uh, used um, any kind of academic uh, resources to support the claims that were made during that process. Um, so that means, for instance, that uh, the fact that um, academic sources like university level books, for instance, um, or peer review articles, uh, the way this kind of uh, academic system works uh, has left out many uh, communities and many identities. Uh, so that is not being considered uh, in the policy. And what is stated is that um, these are the most reliable sources uh, that someone should use, but it doesn't say why or what kind of um, things an editor should have into consideration. Uh, in the case of uh, Spanish Wikipedia, for instance, um, uh, there are, uh, there's a very interesting um, part of the guideline that uh, mentions that um, uh, when academic uh, resources are not available for Wikimedia, I'm sorry, my connection is unstable, so I'm going to turn off my camera. Um, Okay, so, uh, and that's the case of the three languages, English, French, and Spanish. And 
Yes, I'll pass it to, to Monica. Thanks, yes, as Mel said, we noted that there was a lack of rigor in the way that the guidelines themselves were constructed. Sometimes sources were used that seemed to very vague. Um, and of course it is kind of a snake eating its own tail kind of question, like what are the reliable sources that we need to um, create a reliable source guidelines? But what we did find that we really wanted to call into question or highlight for us, for all of us is that the legitimacy of the guidelines was then, if not you, if not sources, the legitimacy of the guidelines was kind of conferred through this process of consensus. And we find this process really problematic. Um, and let me explain what it is. So consensus, according to Wikipedia's own uh, page on the process, is defined as the normal and invisible process that naturally happens between editors. Editors participate in the writing of a page or in the creation of content until they reach a resting point, after which silence is presumed to mean consensus. So this really makes uh, participating um, in something where there's already kind of consensus in the process very rigid. It's difficult to participate, to raise problems. Um, and there's the rule around consensus that if you disagree, the onus is on you to say so. Um, so silence as a signal of consent um, privileges those editors who feel comfortable participating in dialogues on the platform um, and creates a kind of legitimacy around what was there to begin with, a kind of uh, privileging of those who participated in the creation of the project, you know, 15 years ago, um, gives them kind of more legitimacy than those who are participating more recently. Um, and as well, one must participate in and wiki processes in order to have their voices heard. So the kind of kind of knowledge creation that happens in editing. Um, and we have on this slide here, photographs of people who are in person meeting um, and talking. Those kinds of agreements or conversations are not like legitimate in terms of the creation of guidelines and policies. Um, and we, we really wanted to highlight uh, that um, as problematic. And now I'll, I'll hand it over to Amber. Yeah, and that sort of brings us to our third and final finding, which is the essential work of trainers. So in the ways in which um, the, the labor on Wiki is mostly um, exclusionary of people doing the work off Wiki, we wanted to uplift the work of all those folks. And so um, those people are building a buffer between the platform and the interests of newcomers to the community, especially those who are prepared to contribute subject area specific content or and, and or strengthen the editorial procedures. So people with lots of knowledge about what they're talking about, but are not necessarily participating in discussions, either because of lack of time, uh, know how um, uh, access, uh, but who are doing really, really important work on this platform. So I'll go to the next slide. We wanted to talk about our recommendations and then get into a conversation. So we have a few recommendations. Our first is that reliability should not mean exclusion. Um, we we want to talk about how um, some of the work that needs to be done relates to the contents of the reliable source guidelines. So we want to ask that there's funding and resources to redevelop these guidelines and that there should be a task force. This should not be um, necessarily um, given to the people who are already engaged should be something that's opened up to a larger community. Uh, it has to be a broad range of stakeholders and it should obviously include trainers and librarians, academics, people um, with community-based subject matter experience. We want to decenter English uh, and the de definition of reliable sources that are Western-centric. We want to improve the guidelines in each language foregrounding references to scholarship in the social science and humanities that address the historical and cultural specificities of the concept of reliability. And we think it's important to offer guidelines for editors on how to address ways scholarship and new media can reproduce biases. So we feel like a task force is the way to go forward, mostly because it's a process that many people can collaborate on. We feel like uh, what we've learned is that there, there is no source of authority here and that it's a collaborative process. Monica. Thanks, Amber. On that note, yeah, the, the, um, <clears throat> the 
the reworking of this, I think, and this is one of the reasons why we're here today to present this with you is to think through um, how might we guide editors to think about how they might assess the reliability or the authority of a source. Um, and a task force would be a way to kind of think through that question um, and not necessarily have it on us to just go in and edit the page, um, but to include more stakeholders in the process of doing so. Um, and in doing that, we may be um, it, using kind of technical questions too, like enabling the visual editor or other uh, um, technical processes that can make participation in the community pages of Wikipedia a little easier um, for folks. So, and that's something that we lay out more clearly in, in the, or that we lay out in the, in the document. Um, and now I'll hand it to Mel for the last recommendation. Thanks, Monica. Uh, the last recommendations are about community processes, and we first uh, think that there, there's a need to revisit the user consensus definition and processes. Um, CITES as, as consensus is problematic, um, and we suggest that a task force uh, is assembled to develop um, to develop a user consensus process, user consensus process that is welcoming to all editors and potential editors. And there was a question from one of the participants about uh, if we had, um, for instance, if we have tried to edit the page uh, directly. And I think we, we think it's a very complex issue. And one of the problems is that. Um, there, the way Wikipedia works and uh, the way discussions work, uh, the users uh, who are considered most authoritative are the, the ones who have most uh, more editions. And that is not the case of other kind of Wikimedia contributors, such as trainers, Wikimedia in residents. And that's related to the second recommendation. And we consider that it's necessary to celebrate and to uplift the work of trainers and Wikimedia in, res in residence because they are an important part of the community. Uh, and right now, uh, the way how it works, um, they really, uh, we really can participate uh, in discussions in a very um, open way um, because we, we, we are not considered uh, like Wikimedia uh, or part of the community even. Um, so there needs to be more direct support for trainers positions, um, especially given how consensus work on Wikipedia. And the third recommendation, it's a more technical one. Uh, it's related to how the platform works and how participating in top pages, for instance, uh, requires a technical knowledge. Uh, that definitely new users don't have. Uh, so there's a technical barrier there. And we thought that the visual editor was a, a good um, way to overcome that. We know that there have been some, uh, some projects uh, already that are working on making top pages more intuitive. And we think that's a good, uh, a good path. And we hope that this can be continued in the future. So we wanted to hear from our community because you know we have all these recommendations, but it's a huge jump to turn it into actions. And so this is where we wanted to turn it into more of a conversation and hear from you. Um, of course, if you have questions, this is a great time to jump in and, and ask them. Um, but otherwise we have some, some prompts for the discussion as well and some questions for, for all of you. So I see Evelyn is raising her hand. Would you uh, like to unmute and ask your question? And then we can go to Pete. Yeah, um, well, thanks uh, for doing this uh, research. It's actually really interesting. Um, I read it and I was like, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense. So I have two questions. Um, question number one is how, uh, so far, how do you feel that the 
community reaction to the findings on the report has been so far? And then the second question, I mean, is the community reacting, how, how is the community reacting to the report? Um, and then the second question is like, in, in your recommendations, you sort of say, maybe we need to put together some type of advisory board um, to do you know, some work around this. Um, do you have any ideas on how do you ambition that? Um, how do you see that work moving forward? And whether it's only going to be for this, um, uh, only for the reliable sources, or do you see this advisory board sort of trying to take on a little bit more of the other policies that are flaky at the very least to say? <laughs> I can answer that. Sure. So for the first part, I'd say that um, overall the reactions have been um, have been fairly positive. We have had uh, quite a lot of nice emails from people saying they appreciate the report. It resonated with them. We've had um, the expected pushback, especially on Wiki. So when we've posted the report um, on the guidelines pages themselves, in French it was ignored. In Spanish, I believe there was no um, there was no feedback as well. But in English, there was quite a bit of response, some of it very positive and some of it more critical. And the criticality um, was from the, you know, the expected, the expected persons, persons, you know, people who have a lot of uh, privilege on the platform already. So people with a lot of administrative privilege who may feel that their position of power might be challenged by a report like this. Um, interestingly, we've had quite a bit of positive feedback from the foundation itself, and I think that leads into the second question about how we would um, form an advisory board and who might be on it. And um, I'm not saying that we would necessarily be working with the foundation, but I would say that there is quite a bit of work being done um, by the foundation around the 2030 strategy that I think sort of it hopes to think through some of these policies and practices and I'd say that there's um, a big divide, as we all know, between the community using Wikipedia and what happens uh, with the foundation and what happens with Wikimedia more generally. And that as long as that divide is so, um, you know, as, as, as long as the projects are so cleaved together, but also so at odds with each other, it will be very hard to do this work. And so clearly there has to be some kind of first step, which is to restore trust in the community and between the two communities. Monica, yeah, you... if I can jump on that, I think your question is really interesting because you ask what kind of responses from the community and it's like we have community in quotation marks here. And this is something that we've called into question by saying there are people who want to contribute to this project who do contribute, but who are somehow considered less legitimate members of this community um, for different reasons. And so we um, we are involved in Wikipedia and care about the kind of knowledges that are represented um, and shared out and the processes by which this happens. Um, and uh, the so, so we're also here today to ask what kind of feedback do you have um, as members of the Wikimedia community um, who may not be writing responses um, on Wiki. Uh, so, uh, thank you for that um, and for kind of helping us think through that tension and for your response, Amber. Um, we, uh, let's see, I think we we attended to the your two questions. So now we can take, uh, Pete, you had a question. And if you wanted to ask a question, you can throw it in chat or raise your hand. Go ahead, Pete. Sure. Um, I think actually first, um, just kind of in response to that pre the previous point, um, did I was there coverage? Did I miss coverage in the signpost of the report? The I don't know if it's post? been in signpost. I think I would. I would. I mean, I'm you know I'm speaking as a former editor of the of the signpost, uh, but I would I would very uh, highly recommend uh, that someone write it up. For that, uh, and I'm I'm potentially willing to uh, to work with someone on that. I'm not sure that I really have the capacity to uh, to go back through the report in the kind of depth to like write a, a review 
all by myself. Uh, but I, but if there's someone who wanted to work with me on that, I could do it. But I think that is like, you know, I think many uh, longtime Wikipedians kind of regard that as like sort of the or one of the sort of most central places for like the consideration of big ideas. You know, that that um, that if something is presented there, like people will see that that aren't actively monitoring the talk pages for the policies that you're talking about and things like they might have it on their watch list, but they might have 2000 pages in their watch, watch list, but the signpost they might actually read every month. Um, and and they might actually get into discussion there. So I, I think that's sort of an opportunity not to be missed when you're when you're looking to kind of get the the broad attention of the community. Uh, and it's and you know it's not hard to get something in there if you if uh, you know obviously it would be I think ideal if you have people independent of your research writing a review of it but that doesn't always happen so I think just you know sort of writing up your findings in a format that's more um, you know sort of of the of the signpost uh, is a way that you'll get more people paying attention to it than would actually download and read a 50 page report. Um, and I guess that's somewhat related to the other the other point I was going to bring up, which is, um, and this this I think is probably a whole, I, 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 you know, we might kind of want more time or, or to to go into more depth on this, but I I think as as a longtime Wikipedia editor myself, who um, you know, and I, I I very much appreciate and agree with sort of the general. Um, uh, approach that your that your research takes and uh, and the kinds of recommendations you know especially the idea that there should be rigor and um, you know and and a solid foundation for everything in the reliability uh, policies and guidelines etc but I think there's there's kind of a, um, a, 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 a there's a subtle danger in sort of like or there's sort of the like the ways that 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 you talk about it can be, disrespectful in ways that aren't necessarily intent or can be seen as disrespectful to the people who have sort of done the work that came before. So just to sort of, sort of like broad stroke it, like if I had been, I wasn't, but if I was one of the people who, you know, 15 or 20 years ago wrote up the first reliable sources guideline um, and sort of did the best that I could without having a detailed back, you know, academic background in it, you know, not being a woman, not, you know, being a, being a, a white man and all of, you know, everything that goes along with that, but sort of did the best that I could and maybe it's flawed. Um, you know, I might have the perspective that it would be a sensible next step that people with an academic background or people with more demographic variety would be improving on that over a time, but to hear my work described as the problem or a problem without a lot of qualification around it would be a little hard to take. Um, so I just I just kind of want to caution you around that kind of language. Um, and I know it can be, uh, I, I mean, I feel like there's sort of a lot of, uh, I, I don't want you to tone down the substance of what you're saying, because I think that what, what you're generally saying in this report is important, but I just think it's something to be aware of. So that's that's all I have. Thanks, Pete. Um, Ahmed, you put a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to turn your mic on. Hi, everyone. Yeah, um, one of the questions that really uh, came into my mind as I was reading the report is, would it be helpful to actually um, either, you know, re reunite the people who contributed to the town halls or recruit other volunteers to go and really attack, <laughs> or not attack, but really um, head at the reliable sources guidelines themselves with some of your recommendations and create a direct conversation with the people who, you know, the editors who created these rules, see their direct feedback. Um, what do you think about that? Um, I can reply. Thanks for that, Ahmed. I think thinking through your question um, with respect to what Pete just mentioned, we want to be really cautious because there are people, um, some of whom are still around, some of whom like we were in touch with Slim Virgin who has since passed away. Um, there's people who have been involved in this project for some time and there is a lot of turnover in a way on Wikipedia and there we have respect for um, and I have participated in this project since 2012 as an editor um, for the work that goes on. It's a lot of work, um, but we're also, we want to respect that, but we're also noticing there's ways that people are having conversations that aren't happening on Wikipedia. Um, there's conversations around, for example, uh, like 
catalogs that are in art galleries or for for presentations and these are not these are edited um they present biographical and conceptual information but according to the ways in which they're interpreted by other editors who people are not in the room who are in the room of wikipedia they're not considered reliable so it's difficult to kind of work trying to think through ways to reconcile these ways in which community is formed um and so going in and just jumping in and editing the page while it seems like it would be an attractive way to go we're we we want to be really cautious and thoughtful um and so it's 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 not uh we want to involve people more than ourselves we can as critics this is like a critique of love right we can be like we want to participate in this project and we want more voices involved we want more people involved how can we do this in a way that is like a gesture of love um, and going in and editing the page may find us in situations where we're misunderstood where not everybody who should be involved is involved where not everybody can be in the room at the same time um, so that's why we're suggesting we take it slow um, and one of the things that we're doing with this report here is highlighting like what makes this hard to begin with um, i hope that helps uh, amber or mel do you want to jump in with anything yeah, I would also just say that my my experience in um, with Wikipedia since 2014 is that you know there's so much gatekeeping that happens on the platform, and um, I would be hesitant to throw people into that without all the advanced planning that Monica was describing. And Pete, I saw you say yes, that is wise, and I I I feel like that's really important. There's a lot of gatekeeping. There's a um, I don't think we have to like you know avoid the elephant in the room. There's a lot of harassment. On Wikipedia, that harassment is often directed um, towards people who might be invested in doing this type of editing work, and so being uh, careful and cautious is important. You know, there is the the be bold mentality, which is fantastic, but it's it's a privileged position to be bold on Wikipedia. Um, does that answer your question, Ahmed? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Mel, did you want to add? No, not really. There are two people who have raised their hands. I think EJ e. Gertz uh, and also Francesca Tripoli. Yeah, thank you. I think we can go with EJ. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Emily Gertz. Uh, I'm a journalist based in New York, and I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Women Do News Project to increase the quality and number of bios of women journalists uh, on Wikipedia. And, um, you know, there are parts of our project that have been very directly inspired by art plus feminism's approach. So thanks for having this event. Uh, um, I wondered if in your uh, research, you looked at the factor of time, uh, in addition to uh, silence versus being outspoken on Wikipedia. Um, because one thing I've observed as I, I've gotten more uh, actively involved in editing on the site, uh, despite I've been an editor for a long time, but hadn't done very much until joining this project, is that part of the phenomenon of challenging uh, a post, uh, a bio of a woman journalist say, is that people want to reach a decision very quickly. And there is this sort of you know, stampede approach that happens um, where once the critics of the page have ine inevitably touched off uh, the Fuhrer, they, they, they don't rest <laughs> until, until someone makes a decision. And that can really work against us because we are, we don't necessarily have time to monitor all these discussions in the moment. So do your recommendations look at whether there needs to be like a, a certain framework for time in addition to feedback? I mean, that's huge. And I think you're you're emphasizing something that we've all experienced as edit-a-thon participants and trainers where you're in there, you're creating an article, and the next thing you know, you're hardly finished with it and it's already been flagged for speedy deletion for some reason that you don't even understand. And then it just hits you in the gut and you're like, oh my God, but I'm not even done yet. Like what happened? Um, we have uh, we have the recommendation to support trainers. Um, and I think trainers perform 
um, a very essential and important labor. But when people are volunteers and all of us, like our funding ran out, we're volunteers in some capacity to, to, fit, to do this work that we're doing here. And the kind of labor that we're asking people to participate in to even update the guidelines will require a, a massive amount of time. Um, and, and so like, I think we're looking for collaborators in that sense to continue what we're doing. We also have Francesca uh, Tripodi here with us and she put out a report um, or a, a peer reviewed journal article recently that discusses, um, hi, thank you for coming. Uh, I think what, we're, what you're ra point raising here, which is that often women are, articles about women are more likely to require this kind of labor um, than articles about uh, biographies of men. Um, and that's something that's beyond the scope of our research here. Uh, I think we can ex we've experienced it anecdotally and we're focusing on the the guidelines themselves and the process of consensus, but it's 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 for sure real. Um, and I think Francesca, you are next. So if you wanted to uh, pick up here. Sure, I actually, I had a question related to your research. We can talk about this other stuff too, if that's where community wants to go, but I joined to talk about your awesome work. So um, one, I'm sad it wasn't out before I could cite it because this is a really cool project that you were working on. I had a, two questions for you. One is about this idea of academic sources, because I feel like in my research, there's like contention around whether or not an academic source is reliable or not, specifically about if an academic have writ has written said source. And there's been a lot of really interesting work looking at how hard it is for academics to establish Wikipedia articles because a lot of their work is journal articles that they write, but that according to Wikipedia guidelines that doesn't establish like notability. And so I wonder how you all consider this, like, I mean, I guess I just like to think of your thoughts on this, on how um, academics could establish themselves as having Wikipedia pages, because I think that helps people find us, right, when we want to get out our research. Um, but also some of that research is like cited in third party sources, and it seems weird, like, should we be citing the news uh, that's citing the research or citing our research. And I think that's like super confusing. And so I was just would love your thoughts on that. And, and then the second question I was having was like around compensation for trainers. And, you know, I know there's like a real culture and value of volunteerism uh, on Wikipedia. And I think that's super important, but how might we get trainers who, as you identify, are such a clear part of helping make Wikipedia a more equitable place, like, I, I couldn't tell, like, are you advocating for that being paid labor? If so, would that complicate, like, editorial process? How do you think people could get paid doing that? Um, I don't know, just kind of questions around compensating that, that labor. Mel, do you want to take it? If not, I can. Uh, no, please go ahead. Okay, so I think the first, well, I'll start with the second part, the compensation. First of all, I think people should be paid for their work, but I also recognize that there's not necessarily going to be the resources to pay everybody for their labor here. And I think that one of the beautiful things about this project is that uh, it is volunteer run and it's huge and it's it's a global project it, or it, it has the potential to be a global project. Um, I don't think that having volunteer labor excludes people from getting paid when and where they can, nor do I think that it, uh, discredits the labor that they've done in contexts where they have been paid as trainers or as Wikipedian and, and residence positions. So yeah, I think it would be fantastic if people got paid, but I don't expect that one day somebody's just going to hand all this money over and then it's going to be distributed equitably. I don't think that's a realistic goal. Um, but I, I do think that like in the context where people are doing um, meaningful change making, it would be productive to offer compensation. Um, and I, I don't know if I have an answer now how that could be done. Um, I would also say that, um, like, in terms, in terms of the citations around academics, as a, I'm going to speak like from a, from a trainer's position right now, uh, you can't cite the material about that a person has created because that's you know what makes them notable, and so it can't be cited. But there's really nothing that talks about our labor as academics 
um, in any meaningful way that's recognized. So of course, those are reliable resources. There are reliable sources when it comes to speaking about the subject matter. So I'm an art historian. If I write about a local artist and then I try or somebody tries to create a page for them, then yes, that's a reliable source. But it's not a reliable source for me. And you know, this is a separate issue, but what's considered notable or what makes somebody notable, those academic uh, contributions are necessarily enough to make me notable. I'd have to have um, a more visible public presence um, because of the way that it's been set up. But I would say that the notability guidelines, which are separate, but like related to reliable sources, um, they're not equal across disciplines. So they're obviously going to be more stringent for academics, for people in the sciences than they are for people working in, for example, cinema. Uh, if you're a pop star, uh, even of like very minor contribution, you will probably have a page and that's fascinating. And then the amount of reliable sources written about that person might be fewer and also might not be relevant. So the example I often train with um, is, what's his name, that, that hot man who played Aquaman, Jason Momoa. Jason Momoa claims um, uh, indigenous ancestry and the citation for many, many years was 21 cool facts about jasonmomoa.com. And that was the reliable source that was given weight on Wikipedia. But of course, if I tried to write an article about an academic that was like the website was 21 cool facts about Francesca Tripodi right away out the door, you know? Um, so I think that there's some work to do on these policies and, and practices that, um, you know, there's some significant work that needs to be done. But from a trainer's perspective, I understand how uh, our labor is not the secondary source that can create the article for us or that can make us notable. What, yeah. What I hear in your question is kind of something that we're trying to tap into when we talk about consensus, which is are the communities and people and knowledges that are being represented involved in the creation of processes about this representational process? And often they're not. Right, we have, there is a guideline about the notability of academics. How involved were the kind of the communities? Was there a peer review process that happened where academics went, yeah, this is how we decide whether or not someone Matt, you know, is legitimate in our community. Um, maybe that happened, maybe it didn't. And, and this is where we're going. How is it that if we don't participate in this, then we're simply like condoning what's already taking place. And we think this is a, this is a problem. Um, about about sourcing that happens, yeah, as you said, beyond, this is about beyond biographies. This is about any content, you know. And thank you for that question. Thank you. Keith has offered to talk quickly about funding and like funding for trainers. And I wonder if, yeah, yeah, we can make a moment for that. Yeah, um, let's see, I'm, I'm not, not sure what I can really say that would be useful in a short amount of time. Um, the, uh, you know, the, certainly there have been many questions around uh, around paid editing and 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 various kinds of payment around uh, Wikipedia work over the years. I think the I think the important uh, simple thing to keep in mind is that just because someone has pushed back against something at some time doesn't necessarily mean that it's controversial. I think often um things happen in the wikipedia space where you know someone makes a comment and nobody pushes back on it and it feels like it's coming from the community um and that's not always necessarily true so and and even if something is controversial doesn't mean that it can't be uh that it can't be pursued. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I've I've done uh, over the course of the the Wikipedia in residence program is really tried to to kind of push to develop sort of codes of ethics around that because there are or you know things along those lines um, because there are really ways that someone in a paid position can 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 do a lot of harm whether they mean to or not um, and and so I think having um having like sort of you know clear guidelines on how you approach your work that are sort of published and that there are ways that you hold yourself accountable to that can really go a long way towards like those are the things that make you more accepted by the community if you're sort of upfront about like these are the ways in which i'm honoring wikipedia and its ethos and its and its goals 
Um, those are the kinds, like, I think the kinds of things that are done in this report and in this work, if properly expressed, are the kinds of things that will make it naturally well accepted by people in the Wikipedia community. Maybe not every single person, but, um, you know, I think, you know, like relying, like the, there, there's a lot of strength in a project that has proceeded on in, in a rigorous way itself. And like at a at kind of a basic level, that's the sort of approach that the Wikipedia community values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I feel thanks. like I've rambled a bit there, but I'm 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 happy to get into it more. I I feel a little constrained because I don't want to, you know, sort of take it off into, uh, yeah. you know, too much into that direction. But if we want to have a follow up discussion, I'm, I'm seeing people to. asking questions about paid positions, and I've been in a paid position before as a Wikipedian in residence. Someone mentioned Lane Amber's been a Wikipedian yeah. in residence. Um, there's a whole network, the Ren network of people who have been paid living wage or have be doing Wikipedia work a part of their job. Um, this isn't necessarily recognized on Wiki, um, but many Wikipedians and residents will create a separate username that um, identifies the work they do as a Wikipedian and residents from their volunteer account. Um, and, you know, transparency, having reports about what the work that they're doing. Um, some of this has been funded by the Wikimedia Foundation. Some of it's been funded by like the consumer reports position that Lane Raspberry had was funded by consumer reports. So, and there's m numerous examples of this. Um, and a lot of it has been really fantastic work. I think um, that showcases how important it is to have people um, who are kind of bridging Wikipedia with other communities. Um, and it enables that kind of invisible work to happen for a person to be paid for it, to do it. Because otherwise you often have to prioritize other work. Um, so it would be great to see like an extension of the work that's been done here taken up in a way where it could it's sustainable. Um, and often that means like having somebody like do it in a way where they're earning a living wage. Um, but that's not the only way that it needs to happen either. So, so we're raising ideas here um, and we have gone over the hour. So thank you all for staying. Um, is there any other outstanding um, points that I missed that we missed? Amber or Mel? I think we're, we're good, but I do wanna mention we'll be at Wikimania. Yes. So if you want to continue this conversation with us or know others yeah. who might be interested, come hang out with us there. Yeah, and we will be taking like the next few months to do our best to share this out. So we've aimed, we did the report, we're celebrating and we're working on like getting the word out that this is what we've done um, and kind of sharing our critique of love to slowly think about what might be next steps. And we'll be at Wikimania. I think we'll aim to be at Wiki Conference North America. Um, as well. And so thank you all. Thank you to Wikicred as well for supporting our efforts and to Art and Feminism and Mel and Amber. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. It will be recorded and I think Kira will follow up uh, with accessing all of that. So I think there's like some fun over between EJ's question about time and our yes, ability to time. share out. And I'm like, yeah, there's just no time. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a wonderful, um, you know, insight. I've learned so much, and I hope that we'll see more of this coming from the community. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Adi. Bye, Mariana. Thanks, everyone.